we come before you one more time this morning. We thank you for the privilege that we have of being here in the house of God this morning, gathered together with folks uh, all around us. And we're thankful for the, the ability, the ways that you've given us to get the word of God out. Thank you for the transmitter that was so reasonably prized and made it easy for our little church to be able to share the gospel with folks that might not be comfortable with coming in. And even within a mile of here, Lord, if people tune in, they can hear the good news of the gospel and hear these songs and hear the word of God. Father, we thank you for all these ways that you've made for us. But Father, we want to give back to you now so that we can continue to support them and maybe even find other ways where we can share the word of God with a lost and a dying world. We saw the church sign at McDowell this morning that said there's no greater time to share the gospel than in a time of darkness. Amen. And so we're living in that time right now. Help us to be faithful in doing what you call the church to do, and that is to take the good news of the gospel to a lost and a dying world. Now bless this offering, those who can give and those who cannot, but we ask you bless it. May it be used for the furtherance of the word of God. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. You may be seated. If you've been here through this series of messages, you know what I'm going to say now. Verse uh, 17, I believe it is, says that his disciples remembered when he, when he said to those money changers, Get your money out of here. And he ran the oxen and the doves and everybody out. And he said, Make not my father's house and the house of merchandise. And uh, it said that uh, take these things, things hence, make not my father's house and the house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered. They thought, Oh, well, we remember when that was said and quoted in the Old Testament. This is the fulfillment of it here, right, right here. And then after. He told them that he could raise this temple up in three days if it was destroyed. They thought he was talking about the, the church, the synagogue there. And uh, he was actually talking about the temple of his body. And when he was risen from the dead, the scripture says that his disciples not only remembered that he had said that unto them, but they believed it. And so it's the same introduction that I have given for several weeks. By the way, before I get further... I just want to thank God today. That man right there three weeks ago walked in with an air tank. And today he stood up and sang a special. I want to thank God for that. And so for several weeks now I've introduced this in the same way. You ever been to one of those church services? Those of you who have been in church most of your life. And when you left you said, well that was one of those messages that we really couldn't shout about. Well that's what I'm preaching today. In fact, I'm going to be flat out honest with you before I tell you my subject. Some of you are going to squirm in your pew. This is one of those when you will wish that you'd been one of the folks in the parking lot today. Because it's a very, very, it shouldn't be, but it's a sensitive subject. And the reason that I'm going to concentrate on one thing today is because I told you all ago that my wife and I are celebrating our 30th anniversary Tuesday. So today I'm preaching on marriage. And I've never heard of ever picked out an entire message or felt like the Lord wanted me to preach an entire message just on the subject of marriage. Now, let's just, let's just get the dust out of the way. Let's just get the cloud out of the way. We have folks in our congregation that have been married more than once. We all know what God's Word says about that. His plan was one. Amen? Whether you've, whether you've experienced that or not, can you amen that? Amen. That was God's plan. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Amen. Aren't you glad for the forgiveness of God? Aren't you glad that things didn't come to an end when that marriage ended? And I know some of you may have been with the same mate all these years, but you may have kids that have went through this. Divorce is a horrible, horrible thing. It, it splits up relationships. It tears families apart. But when... God is the only thing that can bring any healing to that at all. Let me just, and that's what I'm, I'm not going to talk about divorce. That's it. I'm, that's as far as I'm going on that today. And I know some of you would be real glad about that. I dated Beth six years before I got married. And it wasn't because I was too cheap to get married. There was one main reason, and we've laughed about it and discussed it for years and years. There was one main reason. God had already called me to preach. And I felt like the second most important decision I was going to make in my life was who I married. And I am of the belief that a minister is to be the minister of one wife. Amen. 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 Not everybody agrees with that in this community because you've got Baptist preachers that have been married before and they're ministering today. And that's between them and God. I'm not going to judge them. That's between them and God. But... I felt like if our marriage had not worked out, I would have had to have left the ministry. That's just my, my conviction. That's my spiritual conviction right there. So this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to preach. I'm going to give you things from the Word of God about marriage. Now, do you all know why marriage really doesn't work out for tennis players? Because love means nothing to them. <laughs> if you don't know tennis, you won't understand <laughs> Love means nothing to me. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the privilege 
that we have to be here at the house of God today. And Lord, you know already that uh, what you've laid upon my heart can be a very sensitive subject. And it's a lot of things in God's Word are and causes us to sometimes be uncomfortable. But Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would guide my thoughts and my tongue today and help me to say that which will glorify and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And regardless of who they are, when they leave this place today or after they watch it by way of the website or in the parking lot or on the radio, whatever it is, I pray that they can say amen to the Word of God. So Father, I just pray that you'd have your will and your way. And Lord, I do pray especially. It's our young people that I'm hoping will hear this message today especially. And so I pray that you'll have your will and your way in our midst. Now, Father, we pray for those that we've mentioned here today that are sick. And of course, our attention right now in the whole world has been placed upon this virus. And we have folks that are associated with this church that are sick with it right now. And we're asking God that you would please touch them and strengthen them and lift them up from this. Completely heal them of it would be our prayer. And Father, we pray that you would keep us safe. And God, please give us some discernment on this. I know as much as I try to be in tune, Lord, with the Word of God and what's going on in the world, I'm reminded that the devil is the author of confusion, that God is not. And there's a lot of confusion in our world right now, so I don't believe it's from you. So I'm asking God that you give us discernment, help us to know what we should do, shouldn't do, what we need to believe, what we should discount. God, I just pray that you give us spiritual wisdom at this time. Now again, Father, we thank you for the word. We pray that you would bless it to our hearing. For it's in Jesus' name that, pray, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's talk about marriage this morning. And uh, in my prayer there, I did mention this. I believe that the adults here are very well aware of what God's word says about marriage. You've got a pretty good handle on that. I'm hoping that our young people that will either be sitting here today or maybe in the parking lot or by way of our website, and, and we're hoping real soon to be able to uh, live stream our broadcast regardless, but we want our young people to really grasp a hold of what God's Word says about marriage. Now, first of all, in Proverbs 18 and verse 22, God's Word says this, Whoso, and that is a shortened term of our whosoever, so I'm going to put it that way. Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Now, I'm going to say this. I do believe that there are some individuals that marriage was just not for them. My wife's first cousin is a world-traveling evangelist. And he has been all of his life. Ever since he was a young man, he has traveled all over. He has his own ministry. He has his own uh, travel facility. He goes all over. He flies to foreign countries. He preaches. Uh, he is uh, uh, a student of Billy Graham and of uh, oh the guys down in Tennessee. I forget the, the uh, name right now. I can't remember their last name. But he is a prodigy of these individuals. And he travels all over the place and has for many years now. He's very close to my age. He has never been married. He has never felt the, the need or the desire to be married. He felt like that the ministry that God has given him is, is that which is what God wanted for him. So marriage not always is for everybody. But can I say this? It should never be denied someone who wants to be married or believes it's okay. Amen. Now, if you're not picking up on what I'm talking about, there are churches that believe their ministers are married to Christ and the church, and they should not be married to a woman. In those churches, if you've paid attention the last 20, 25 years, it finally came out of the closet. A lot of sexual abuse was committed by these men who were told by their leaders, you cannot marry a woman. Can you amen that? Amen. And we've seen that church pay out billions and billions and billions of dollars either in settled lawsuits or to try to avoid some of them. 
And it was all because that church falsely believes that the man that ministers in their church has no right to be married. And that's not right. That is incorrect. That is not in the keeping of God's word. So the verse that I read to you, Proverbs 18, 22 says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth, obtaineth favor of the Lord. How does he obtain favor of the Lord? First of all, when Adam and Eve, or when Adam was in the garden by himself with God, what did God say? It's not good that man should be alone. Amen. And so God placed Adam to sleep, removed a rib from his side, and made woman. And Adam named her Eve. And she became his helpmeet. And God provided a good thing for Adam because he needed somebody. I'm glad, and I'm going to stay personal with this today because I don't want to embarrass anybody else. But I'm very thankful that Beth was provided for me. Uh, we got off to kind of a rough start because I was older. I was 31. She was 25. I was set in my way. She had lived by herself for quite a while. And it was still another six years before Seth came along. Two years after that, Hannah came along or 17 months or so. And uh, But I'm, I, we look back today. And Beth is my best friend. I can confide in my wife in things that I can't confide in you. And that's the same way with you and your spouse. You can talk about things together that you cannot tell me. And I believe that that's the way God made it. Can you agree with that? Amen. The scripture says in Ephesians 5.31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Amen. By the way, God's word says that if a man... Uh, commits fornication with a whore, with a prostitute, he said, don't you know they become one as well? And that is, a, that is outside of God's will. That is a union that is outside of God's will. God wants us to find, and by the way, on Proverbs 18.22 that I shared with you, in the studying of that verse, it means there, whoso findeth a virtuous woman. Whosoever findeth a virtuous woman, a wife, has obtained the favor of God and is a blessed man. So, this next verse, it said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Now, I don't know you all as well as maybe what I should, so I'm going to be able to say this very comfortably. I'm going to tell you some of the most troubled marriages that I have ever seen in my life was where the, either the husband or the bride refused to move away from their mom and dad. And, and you know, again, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but God's Word says that a man is to leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and they are to become one flesh, one union, one body. And so one of the greatest pieces of advice that I think that God would give us in marriage is that you need to get away from your family at least for a while and you need to establish your own home. That doesn't mean you don't like them. It doesn't mean you don't go have dinner with them on Thursday night or whatever. It doesn't mean that you don't stop by to visit. But it means that you don't live there anymore. Amen. You have started your own home. And uh, young men, I will say to you, for you to be the head of your home and to say, you are my wife and you are going with me. Uh, Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So inside the union of marriage, we know that intimacy is God's will. Now, I don't mean to embarrass anybody, but I'm just going to be flat out honest with you. All of us were made as sexual creatures. Amen. All of us were. It's just natural. In nature even teaches us that. But it says that inside of marriage, it's an okay thing. Outside of marriage, it is called fornication. And God's Word says that fornicators will not be able to have any part of the kingdom of God. Now, you can interpret that however you want. But outside of marriage, intimacy between a man and a woman is forbidden by the Word of God. And it should not be mentioned among God's people. Now, 
I'm not going to ask how many of you were guilty of this because it would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? What, why did I say that? Because there shouldn't be anybody here thinking that somebody's holier than thou. That somebody's better than somebody else in any way, shape, or form. We are human beings. We are sinful creatures. And sometimes we have given in to temptations that God's Spirit tried to keep us from. And sometimes we give in. We have the, you know what? We are a free moral agent and we have the right to say no to God. We also have the right to pay the price that comes with it. To have the regrets that comes with it. There was a young lady that I grew up with. She was about three years older than me. She was known as a set apart, separated Christian girl. And she went out on one date with a guy at prom. And she's been married to him ever since because she got with child that night. It changed her whole life. It brought embarrassment upon her family and upon her testimony. And it was a, it was a very uncomfortable thing. But she married that young man and they've been married for many, many years. Genesis 1.27 says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, he him. Male and female created he him. The he them. There's some thems and hymns in there. And so I got tongue tied. The whole point of that verse is that God is showing us I made a man and woman. Amen. I did not intend for two men to be married. I did not intend for two women to be married. Amen. It is not Adam and Steve, it was Adam and Eve. That's right. what we've said all these years. Amen. And so, to start out on our introduction today, marriage is a good thing. A man who finds a woman, he obtains the favor of God, especially if she's a virtuous woman. A man and a woman, when they're married, they need to move away from mom and dad, or at least live far enough away where they can establish their own roots, put down their own roots, and get their own family started. Uh, everything within intimacy is okay inside of marriage and God made us man and he made us woman. Now, I'll get off on a little bit less controversial issue here. I say that. 30 years ago when I preached this, I shook because I was a nervous wreck of what people were going to say to me afterwards. You know what? I got a little bit wiser in all these years. I kind of leave my opinion out of it now and I just give you the Word of God. Amen. And then if you have a problem with it, your problem's not with me. Amen. One time I, I preached about what I'm getting ready to talk about here, about uh, a woman and, and uh, being a submissive to the husband and what all that means. And I had a young man meet me at the door when I came back for the evening service. And he said this to me. You did a lot of damage in this church today. And I had to think back because... I hadn't, had, hadn't talked with anybody since the morning service. I, thought, I said, well, what did I do? He said, we don't go for that submissive wife stuff around here. And I said, really? And let me show He said, I don't care what it says. By the way, he's a minister of a church now. He's, he's changed his mind. He's changed his mind. Some of us grow up a little too late is what happens. But I want to give you some responsibilities of husbands. We've talked about marriage as a man and a woman. Everything's okay there. You're, it's a good thing. Marriage is a good thing. Now, with the inside of marriage, God has responsibilities for the husband and he has responsibilities for the wife. Let's talk about the husbands first. Because there is so much offensive stuff taken about the woman's responsibilities. Can I just say to you, if a woman marries a godly man and he lives like he ought to be, like he ought to live, the woman has no issues being who she's supposed to be. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. This is the responsibilities of husbands. I love this. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. You want me to tell you what that means in English? You have a woman, leave the other ones alone. God gave you a wife. Leave the other women alone. Amen. They're off. They're off the chart now. 
Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the street. That is your children. If God blesses you with children, and by the way, God doesn't bless every union with children. I have an aunt and an uncle. The uncle's gone now. He's been gone several years. And they love children. I mean to tell you, they love children, but God did not see fit to give them children. We had a pastor, Fred Cunningham, his wife, Leona, some of the most godly, precious people that you would ever want to know in your life. She became with child one time. The baby was stillborn. It passed away while it was still in the womb, and she was never able to have another one. The scripture says, when my father and my mother forsake me, well, that's another verse, but it says uh, that he maketh the barren woman to be a, 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 a joyful mother, a joyful, anyway, a joyful mother to children. The barren God can make a joyful mother to children. That's from Psalms or Proverbs. But nevertheless, it's only God that can do that. That somebody who has not been blessed with allowing to, to have children, God can make them satisfied. Donna Beckett and Dave Beckett had been married 15 years. No children. They wanted children. She came to the altar, and she I heard her say, God, either give me children or help me to be satisfied without them. And it wasn't hardly any time at all, and she had her first child, and it wasn't very long after that that she had her second little girl. And both of those girls are grown up now and they're serving God. In fact, they are passionate about God. And so God blessed that prayer right there. So I'm going to go on now. It says, let them, referring to the children, let them be only thine, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? So basically, sum it up, is what he was saying was, be satisfied with the woman that God gave you. Love that woman. And cherish that woman. Help her to be your satisfaction. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This is a responsibility of husbands. By the way, when you finally live up to that, let me know. Because I'm telling you, the Bible says that Christ loved the church enough that he gave his life for the church. That is to the extent that you and I are to love our wives. We are not to allow anybody to run over our wives. We need to be in the forefront there saying, Hey, this is my woman you're talking about. This is my gift from God that God has blessed me with. Amen. I'll be honest with you. When my wife comes home sometime from work and she's been mistreated, yeah, I'm telling you, I have to sit down, I have to bite my tongue just a little bit because I feel like it's my responsibility as a husband to go in and defend her. Ephesians 5.28. By the way, Ephesians has a lot to say about the husbands. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his hand his wife loveth himself. So a man needs to love his wife as much as he loves his own self. Amen. Ephesians 5.33 Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. There it is again. Love her just like you love yourself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and what is worse than an infidel. So you know what that says? Get up and go get a job. Amen. Right. Unless you are just physically unable to do that. Don't depend on the government to provide for you and your family. That's your job. Amen. Amen. Guys, this one guy at work teases me every now and then about uh, how come I, I like to get off work on time. And I'm not interested in a bunch of overtime. 
And I said, this is just my part-time job. My real job is ministering the Word of God. Amen. I said, I work, if you want to look at it this way, I've got two jobs, and they're both full-time. It's one reason my hair is white. It's one reason that my mind doesn't work like it used to. And listen, I am not complaining. I'm very thankful that God gave me a job where I can not only provide funds for our food and our housing and any fun that we want to have and insurance on top of that. And then I'm thankful for this where I can minister the Word of God. Amen. God's been good to me. I'm telling you, He's worked it out. Let me just tell you. I was pastoring the Monet Fundamental Methodist Church. This would have been about 95, 96, somewhere in there. And uh, they called me to be the pastor. And where I worked, we worked every other Sunday. So I went to the boss, the plant manager, and I said, I'm going to take the Fundamental Methodist Church from Monet as pastor. I just want to know, and we were working three shifts at the time, we weren't working Sundays. We were not working Sundays at the time. It was during an economic downturn and we weren't working Sundays. I said, if I, we ever go back to working Sundays, what are you going to do with me? And he said, you're the only preacher that we've got here. I'll cover for you. You're taken care of. Don't worry about it. Well, we went back to Sundays. And I went to church and I preached and I didn't go to work. And the boss came to me after a while and I guess there was enough complaints from the men. He said, I can't cover for you any longer. He said, we're on a point system here, and every Sunday now that you miss, I'm going to give you a point, and when you have so many points, I'm going to have to fire you. So I went to the church the next Sunday, and I said, folks, I'm not asking you to pray that I get to keep that job. I'm asking you to pray that God's will be done. You want me to, I'll just tell you, this is shouting ground. The next week, a gentleman that worked in the scrap house, which was five days a week, didn't show up for work, and didn't call in. And they fired him. And the plant manager at that time, a different one, came to me and he said, I think I've got a solution for your problem. And he put me in that five-day-a-week job outside the plant where I didn't have to work Sundays. And guess what? I made more money. <laughs> I got a raise. <laughs> Listen, I believe that a man ought to work. Now we know that God, when we're going to, when we get to the responsibilities of wives, we know what, it, what God's Word says. My wife works. I'm not condemning anybody. But I think especially the husband ought to be the breadwinner of the house if he's physically able. Amen. So let's move on. 1 Peter 3, 7. Now, I haven't heard any engines fire up and people leaving the parking lot, and nobody's got up and left out of here. So I guess everything's going okay so far. Is that all right? Yeah. We're, we're all copacetic. Everything's good. 1 Peter 3, 7 says this, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Listen, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Now, I know that we have a lot of proud women in our day and time, and uh, we've even got a relative or two that, that got really into uh, bodybuilding and, and women doing that and stuff, and it's not attractive to me. I'm just going to be honest with you, it's not attractive to me. Being healthy is fine. Taking care of your heart is fine. Taking care of your weight, you know, and all that, which helps take care of your heart and diabetes and all that, that's wonderful. Do what you can. But God made woman the weaker vessel. And the husband is to treat his wife as if she is the weaker vessel. He is supposed to be the rock of the family. He is supposed to be the strength of the family. Are you kids getting all this? Are you? Okay. All right. Well, we've beat up on the husbands. Let's work over the wives just a little bit, okay? Responsibilities of wives. Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23. Wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, if you have a problem with that, I just read to you from Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23. It's between you, the Apostle Paul, and God. Submission, submission does not mean that a man beats his woman down and she submits to him. That is not what it means. 
Can you amen that? Amen. It means that a man lives such a godly life that his wife is more than thrilled to honor him to be the head of that home. And she recognizes that he is the head of their home just as Christ is the head of the church. Amen. There is nothing to be there is nothing to be offended about there at all. It's God's order. It's God's plan. It's you and I that mess up this stuff. It's not God. It's you and me. Now, Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says this. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now, I'm going to stop right there. This is the older women. God says this to them. I expect them to behave themselves as become holiness. By this time in your life, if you're considered an aged saint woman, saintly woman, you ought to be to the place where those younger women around you recognize the holiness in your life. You already messed up most of your big things somewhere along the way, got them straightened out, and now you're to the point you don't make those mistakes anymore. The younger women ought to be able to recognize that. It says you are not, as an older saintly woman, to be a false accuser, and it says you're not to be given to too much wine. Now, I had to stop and study on that a little bit this morning because I knew somebody was going to pick up on it. And you know what I came to the conclusion was? If you've submitted to that old man for 30 or 40 or 50 years and raised those little brats, you might need a nip every now and then. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Listen, you can debate God's word if you want to. It says not too much wine. Amen. John Williams used to say this. He's an evangelist friend of mine, or was. He was an evangelist. He's still a friend of mine, let me put it that way. Since we're recording this, I won't go into the story of why I just said what I did. I'll tell you later. He used to say this. God's word says, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. And he would stop and he would say this. Now I want you to look that verse over again. It never does say drink it. It might mean rub it on. And it says a little, not a lot. So I always thought that was a good way to explain that. But no kidding, in my study of this, it said that the older women of Greeks and Romans, that when they got past the childbearing stage and they'd been married to the same man for many years, many of them drank too much wine. That's exactly what it said in my study of this, of a good Bible scholar, is that it was a historical knowledge, historical knowledge, that those women tend to drink too much wine. I don't know why. But it says they are to be teachers of good things. So if you are an older saintly woman, it is your responsibility as a child of God to be teaching the younger women good things. Now we're not done yet with these verses. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So in other words, the older women, even though they've already put in their time, if you want to put it that way, <clears throat> they've been through the, the early years of marriage, they've raised children now, probably to adulthood. They get to the end, you know what a lot of people say? I've taught that Sunday school class for 20 years, it's time for somebody else to take it. There is no retirement for the child of God. And that's what he is saying here to the aged women. Now it's time to really go to work. Start teaching the young women how to do all these things. How to be chaste. How to be holy. How to uh, not bring blasphemy upon the word of God. So that they can be good, godly young women. Now you say, Kevin, why are you wasting time on that? Because we need those things today. Amen. This society that we live in needs that. We need, you know, Hannah, our daughter, grew up in our home. 
but she didn't spend all that much time in the kitchen with Beth. But since she got married, she has come to our home to learn how to do things more than she did when she lived there. Mom, how do you do this? How do you cook this? And, and Beth has been very patient in teaching her. And yesterday, Hannah put on her own Thanksgiving dinner for her and Alex and two other couples, I believe it was. And Beth was chomping up the bed. How did it go? How did it go? And finally, I knew she was sitting there waiting for him. And so I texted Hannah while nobody was looking. I said, call your mom and tell her how it went today. And she called. She said, oh, mom, it went great. Everything turned out really good. Our older women need to be touched teaching the younger women not only basic skills like that, but how to live their life so that they can be an honor and a glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds so old-fashioned, doesn't it? Listen, it's exactly what our society needs to be. All right, we're going to close with this. Here's the alternatives to marriage. Now, we start out by saying... Marriage wasn't for everybody. Most people it is. And after a few tries, they usually get it right. <laughs> should have said that. Here's the alternatives to marriage. Well, listen, seriously. I mean, the mistakes have been made. We can't do anything about them now. Can't do anything about them now. But you can just trust God and say, God, I'm so sorry. And I, and, and I want to be forgiven. That's between those individuals and God. Here's alternatives to marriage. 1 Corinthians, I've got two of these verses out of the 7th chapter. Here's verses 1 and 2. He said, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Now, those of you who read the scriptures on, on a regular basis, it actually gives you some instructions on intimacy about not defrauding one another from time to time or long lengths of time so that, uh, th that you become bitter towards one another. Those are things that are personal that have to be discussed within the home that God helps with that. He says there may be a time when you go away fasting and pray and you give yourself totally to that. So, he said it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but if, he, if he's going to touch a woman, he needs to have his own wife and she needs to have her own husband. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 7 through 9 says this, For I would that all men were even as I myself. Why did Paul say that? Because he was never married. Now, Paul came from a family he talked about his sister, and I think she had a family, but Paul himself was never married. The Apostle Peter was. How do we know that? Because Jesus went with the Apostle Peter to his mother-in-law's house Amen. where she was sick. Yes. So we know by reading the Word of God that the Apostle Peter, he was a man who was married. The Apostle Paul never was. He says, For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows. So now he's wrapped all up. I'm going to say something to those that are unmarried and widows. It is good for them if they abide even as I. If you've been widowed and you can go and, and uh, continue your life being unmarried, he said, it's a wonderful thing if you can be just like I am. Why would he say that? Because he gave himself totally to the ministry of God's Word. And he said, if you can do that, it's wonderful. But he's not done yet. But if they cannot contain, in other words, if you can't, without a husband or, or without a wife, if you cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now that word burn there means to burn with lust. And what does lust bring? Lust brings sin. And what does sin bring? Death. That's right. It brings nothing good. Okay. Sharon Ralph, you want to get ready with a song or however we're going to do it. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. This is our last verse. And I know some of you are saying, thank goodness. <laughs> For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Now, 
I, 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 with my hand up, just like old Jerry Clowney, with my hand up, you all know me better than this. This message was not to point at anybody or anything. It's good instruction for the church. That's Amen. the whole reason why I feel like God laid this on my heart today. And our anniversary is this Tuesday. My mind was on that. And uh, I would not do that. I would not pick somebody out and embarrass them for love or money, for nothing. This simply was a message about good instruction from God's Word on how we ought to conduct our lives. Amen. And I hope that you have taken it that way. Now, we're going to have a verse of invitation. I have no idea why, but if you have a need, whether it's due to this message or something else is burdened in your heart today, we want to invite you to come. So we're going to stand and we'll have a verse of invitation. Page 53.